We all know the story of Mrs. Rosa Parks and the Montgomery bus boycott. We learned it in school as a neat, tidy story of individual heroism. Mrs. Parks, a seamstress tired after a hard day at work, courageously sat down. A young preacher, Dr. Martin Luther King, charismatically stood up. They inspired people to march and change happened. Well, let me tell you the story in a way you might not have heard it before. Let's begin with Rosa Parks. Born in 1913, she was the granddaughter of slaves. She was a good student, soft-spoken but strong-willed. Her family believed in standing up against mistreatment. One time when a white boy on roller skates tried to push her off the sidewalk, she pushed back. Mrs. Parks reflected later, I'd rather be lynched than run over by them. In 1931, she met Raymond Parks, a self-taught, politically active barber. He was the first man she deemed radical enough to marry. He was active in the Scottsboro Nine case in which nine young men had been falsely accused of rape. The Communist Party of America financed their defense, and Mr. Parks became an activist in the effort. In December 1943, Mrs. Parks attended her first NAACP meeting. She was the only woman there and was elected group secretary that day, a position she'd hold for the next 12 years. As secretary, she recorded countless cases of unfair treatment, brutality, sexual violence, and lynchings. The local president of the NAACP and her partner for over a decade was Edie Nixon, a member of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters Union, who had also been active in registering voters, including Mrs. Parks. He and Parks were the first working class people to lead a local NAACP. They were eventually elected as state president and secretary as well. Through the NAACP, Miss Parks attended meetings in Jacksonville, Atlanta, and Washington, D.C., where she received leadership training from the legendary NAACP organizer Ella Baker, who became a role model and mentor to her. Miss Baker also inspired Parks to create a youth council in Montgomery. Fred Gray was a 24 year old attorney who had recently moved to town, only the second African-American lawyer in Montgomery and the 12th in the state. Rosa Parks took him under her wing, regularly meeting him for lunch and encouraging him to take on civil rights work. Clifford and Virginia Doerr were the town's leading white liberals. One day, Mrs. Parks was working for Virginia Doerr when they discussed her NAACP work. Mrs. Doerr suggested she attend the Highlander Folk School in Tennessee, where integrated groups of activists developed their leadership in civil disobedience. Clifford Doerr was a board member, and the Doerrs raised money to send Miss Parks to a two-week-long workshop on civil rights. At Highlander, she and 47 other diverse activists lived in an integrated community and developed their strategies and tactics as leaders. She came to admire Highlander director Miles Horton's spirit and sense of humor. She was in awe of Septima Clark, the lead instructor who, like Miss Baker, became a role model and mentor for her as women activists. The workshop rejuvenated her, but she was pessimistic about the prospects of a mass movement in Montgomery. While at Highlander, Claudette Colvin, the 15-year-old secretary of the Youth Council, was on her mind. On March 2, 1955, Miss Colvin refused to move to the back of the bus and was arrested. Her arrest outraged the community. While Mrs. Parks and Mrs. Dewar raised money for her case, the male leaders in town were concerned that she was too dark-skinned, poor, and young to be sympathetic plaintiff to challenge segregation. On October 21, 1955, 18-year-old Mary Louise Smith, another youth council member, refused to move to the back of the bus and was arrested. She was also considered too poor and young to be sympathetic. On Thursday afternoon, December 1, 1955, Rosa Parks refused to move to the back of the bus and was arrested. The same bus driver, James Blake, had thrown Mrs. Parks off his bus in 1943 for refusing to move. She said, I had felt for a long time that if I was ever told to get up so a white person could sit, that I would refuse to do so. Now, does she sound like the accidental activist we've learned about in school and popular culture? The tired seamstress who just wanted to rest her feet after a hard day at work? She often said that the only thing she was tired of was being segregated and mistreated. Edie Nixon and the Doors went to get her out of jail. Nixon saw opportunity to use Mrs. Park's case as an ideal plaintiff to challenge segregation. Raymond Parks didn't agree. After much debate, she and Raymond made the difficult, courageous choice, knowing they'd probably lose everything as a result, and they lost a lot, including their jobs in the process. Mrs. Parks called Fred Gray and asked him to represent her. He called Joanne Robinson, a leader of the Women's Political Council, a group of African-American women who had been calling for a bus boycott. She called Edie Nixon, and they agreed to call for a bus boycott Monday, the day of Mrs. Parks' arraignment. Overnight, Miss Robinson printed more than 15,000 flyers at Alabama State College, calling for the boycott. Can you imagine making 15,000 flyers on 2014 technology, let alone 1955 technology? And this was especially risky since the university was funded by the segregationist state legislature. 
The Women's Political Council members met her at dawn and fanned the community with flyers. At 6 a.m., Edie Nixon phoned Reverend Ralph Abernathy of First Baptist Church and suggested a meeting of pastors that afternoon. Reverend Abernathy suggested that the newest pastor in town, Martin Luther King, at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church would be a good host because he had no set alliances, enemies, and had less to lose if it didn't work out. Dr. King was reluctant at first but eventually agreed. About 50 pastors met that night with Rosa Parks and Joanne Robinson and agreed to support the boycott from the pulpits on Sunday and announce a mass meeting for Monday night. One white pastor, Robert Grates, attended the meeting. He led Trinity Lutheran Church, an African-American congregation, and was an outcast among whites in Montgomery. He hosted Mrs. Park's NAACP Youth Council meetings at his church and was a friend of hers. He remained an important ally throughout the boycott. His home was eventually bombed. On Saturday, Ms. Parks went to Alabama State College, where she was conducting a leadership training for the NAACP. She was discouraged when only five students attended. She was no longer discouraged on Monday, however, when she and other leaders marveled at the empty buses and streets filled with African-American citizens walking to school and work. The boycott was on. Rufus Lewis was a businessman and rival of Edie Nixon's. He did not want Nixon to lead the new Montgomery Improvement Association that was created to sustain the boycott. So he nominated his pastor, Dr. King, to lead it, arguing that he was a neutral choice and hoping he could pull strings from behind. That is how Dr. King was drafted into movement leadership. That night, 15,000 people attended a mass meeting, and the new 26-year-old MIA president, Dr. King, gave a prophetic speech that inspired them to commit to the boycott. Mrs. Parks never spoke or was consulted on strategy. Sexism and the desire to make her into a more sympathetic plaintiff converted the experienced leader into the tired seamstress of civil rights myth. Dr. King had spoken with a pastor in Baton Rouge where they had had a two-week-long bus boycott in 1953 and learned about the carpool system they implemented to get residents to school, work, church, and shopping errands. He assigned Rufus Lewis to put together a transportation plan that involved 350 cars providing thousands of rides each day for 12 months. Mrs. Parks at times worked as a dispatcher. A. Philip Randolph, leader of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters Union and Dean of America's Civil Rights Leadership, sent his best organizer and strategist to Montgomery to help out. Bayard Rustin was a true outsider, a former Communist Party organizer, a pacifist who was jailed for refusing to fight in World War II, and an openly gay black man in 1955. In February, when he arrived, the police had indicted 115 members of the Montgomery Improvement Association. Rustin, a devoted Gandhian who'd spent six months in India, recommended to Nixon that they put on their Sunday best, go down to jail, and turn themselves in. They did so, confounding city leaders. Nixon, Robinson, Parks, and King all believed to varying degrees in self-defense. They all owned guns. Nixon and King's homes had been bombed. Protesters had been attacked. King had actually applied to the governor of Alabama for a permit to carry a gun in his car. Bayard Rustin advised them to get rid of the guns, and he mentored them on nonviolent civil disobedience throughout the campaign. Many others stepped up too. Georgia Gilmore created the Club from Nowhere, and Inez Ricks created the Friendly Club to organize women to make and sell sandwiches, dinners, pies, and cakes during the week to raise money for the Montgomery Improvement Association. Every Monday, they would compete to see who could bring the most money to the mass meetings. Ella Baker and Bayard Rustin formed an organization in friendship to also raise money for the movement. Miss Baker took Mrs. Parks on fundraising trips up north. In May, they hosted a fundraising event featuring Rosa Parks at Madison Square Garden that attracted 16,000 people. But Rosa Parks had been an NAACP officer and organizer for more than a decade. Her husband had been active in an effort funded by the Communist Party. So it was decided that she too was a controversial plaintiff so another woman who refused to move to the back of the bus was chosen to be the lead plaintiff, Aurelia Browder. The Supreme Court struck down segregation in the case of Browder v. Gale, and on December 20, 1956, 382 days after Mrs. Park's Courageous Act, the boycott was over and the buses were integrated. So who is the leader of the Montgomery bus boycott? All of them. Social change always comes from the leadership of the many. We need all kinds of people to step up and play different roles to achieve social change. You can take any part of the civil rights movement or any other social movement and tell a similar story. And you could add many more names to this story. 
It does not diminish the courage of Mrs. Parks or the prophetic vision of Dr. King to acknowledge that their leadership was part of a larger leadership narrative. We need to see leadership as an action many can take, not just a position few can hold. Leadership is a muscle that everyone has, and it only gets stronger with exercise and practice. We need to build the collective leadership muscles of our organizations and communities if we want to create change. We need to support programs like public eyes and community organizing efforts that build the leadership of the many. When the police interrogated Claudette Colvin about who was behind the boycott, she responded, our leaders is just we ourselves. That should be our call to action. Step up.